of Education. She is the History and Social Science Specialist there. Um, it's, always have, it's always a pleasure to have Kristania at these presentations, and I am going to let her um, begin. Thank Thanks for you, being Sarah. here, Kristania. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's kind of weird. It is for me still doing this after um, 18 months going on um, almost two years, I guess we can say. But thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to meet with you all um, in the summer. And this year, um, I was asked to talk about um, those hard topics in history. And I know that we are all going to be um, going back into our um, previous workspaces and we have all of these different things swarming around us. So hopefully today I can provide you with some information that will help you not, in, not only in your um, English language arts classes, but also in your history and social science classes. So I've kind of titled this presentation, Hard History While Providing Reading, Rigor, and relevance in the history and social science classroom. So um, today we are going to have a discussion about hard topics that are hard to teach. Where do we begin with that? And then we'll go through some, um, some strategies for reading rigor and relevance, looking at the, the power of the informational text what does rigor look like in a social studies classroom? And then how can we make that content relevant? Um, we'll wrap up with some updates from the VDOE, um, professional development opportunities that will be coming up in the summer, um, specific to history and social science, and then also um, resources that we are um, putting up on the DOE website. Unfortunately for us, it, we do a document and then that's when we remember that we need to make sure that it is accessible. So it's taking us a little bit of time because they have some hard and fast rules that we definitely need to stick to. But those um, resources will be available either on the DOE website and or I shouldn't say either and or um, on OER, hashtag go open VA. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with a little activity um, that I would like for us to do. And basically it's called, what's in a name? And this is an inclusion activity. And Dale Carnegie said, a person's name is to him or her, the sweetest and most important sound in any language. And in that a lot of people feel like I have a complicated name, which I don't think it's complicated, but that might be just me. What we're going to do, um, I'd like to put you in a few breakout groups and you're not gonna have that much time so you can't linger and go off on a tangent because I'd like everyone to be able to um, have a conversation, but um, personal reflection that I want you to share in your um, breakout groups. I want you to give everybody your complete name, definitely. But um, in looking at, what comes under the name that you prefer, and then by whom were you named, how you experience your name, your perception of how others experience your name. Um, so there'll be three or four people per breakout, but I don't want you to try to do all of those, everyone with their name. So after you give your complete name and your preferred name, choose one of the others, by whom were you named, or how you experience your name, and then your perception of how others experience your name. So going to be in breakouts for about seven minutes. So Bailey, if you wouldn't mind um, transferring, teleporting everyone to a breakout for about seven minutes so that they can discuss their name. Gotcha. I'm doing that now. Thanks. Welcome back. As you're coming back, I want you to think about these two questions. The first, how does this activity relate back to your work as a teacher? And if you would please just drop your thoughts in the chat. How does this activity, when we're talking about our name, the sweetest language that one could ever hear, how does that relate to you or to your work as a teacher? And then secondly, how does this activity you think may relate to teaching hard history, to your work as a teacher. And then finally, teaching hard history. I 
helping students express their identity. Yes. Showing respect. Yes. Yes, me too. All of the mispronunciations. I just did that at our last conference and I was mortified. Heritage, class community. Yes, building relationship. Names do have power. Exactly what is very familiar to them. These are great comments. So that is the first time that we really have an opportunity to provide relevance in what we're teaching. It's the first time, the first opportunity to build a relationship, to build trust, to build that community in our classrooms. So just to give you a little bit about myself, again, my name is Chris Tanya Brown. Um, my name, I was named um, from my mom who wanted to have my brother and sister and I connected to our family. So my name is a derivative of her sister in front of her, Christina, and her two sisters after her. So my middle name um, is Brinette. Brenda and Annette followed my mom. So I am definitely connected to my family. And a name means a lot um, to me. So I am a teacher. I have been a teacher for, this is my 28th year um, in education. And I have loved every single minute of it, even the hard times, bad times, all of that. But my history, I am originally from West Virginia. And the first thing that people say to me when they find out I'm from West Virginia, I had no idea there were black people in West Virginia. Yes, there are. Another thing, I come from a coal mining family. My grandfather was a coal miner. So I, yes, I am a coal miner's granddaughter. Um, my grandparents, my great grandparents were all farmers and um, also worked on the railroad. They also worked in um, people's houses. And then their children went into the military, went into the technological um, and legal um, areas for occupations. And I eventually became a teacher. But all of this history, whether it is the history of our names, whether it is the history of where we come from, whether it's the history of our family, we carry this into our classrooms. And it's not something that should be escaped. It's inescapable. We take it with us into what we are teaching and how we are teaching. Because of the work ethic that I got from my family, that's how I approach my instruction. That's how, how I approach my profession. And that's, how, that's what I wanted to model for my students. So when it comes to focusing on, focusing our instruction on topics like the Holocaust, the civil rights movement, Jim Crow, civics, contemporary issues, protests, movements, all of that. My question to you all is, what makes these topics difficult to teach? What makes these topics difficult to teach? Topics like, what makes this difficult to teach? What makes this difficult to teach? This? 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 this. This. So what makes this difficult to teach? Most of the time, a lot of the times, it's our comfort level our comfort level with the topic, our comfort level that we're, we're probably going to step on someone's toes, our comfort level of what words do I actually use when I'm teaching this history? I don't want to say the wrong word. 
I might not be very well academically inclined to do this. I didn't have this class when I was in teacher college. So we have to first deal with our own comfort levels. So I wanna help you out with um, a few tips. In order to, for us to have the deepest and the most transform, um, transformative learning to occur, in order for this to happen, one of the first things that we have to do is that we have to prepare. We have to know the topic that we are teaching. We have to know the topic that we are supporting. We have to know and understand the strategies that we are going to use. And does it fit with what we want students to know, understand, and be able to do? Next, we have to build that classroom of culture that is respect, empathy, and equal access to resources. Respect, empathy, and equal access to resources. We have to create an environment that allows for disagreement. I'm not talking about fallout, drag out arguments. I am talking about you and I have a difference of opinion of how we have interpreted the facts. Discomfort. Everything in history is not pretty. There are some pretty moments, but everything's not pretty. We're going to be a little uncomfortable. And then discourse. Discourse is that conversation, which may be uncomfortable, which may be a disagreement, but there's still respectful discourse, civil discourse about our differences of opinions about the facts. It's all going to boil down to the facts. And then lastly, relevance. Does not probably seem relevant a March in 1921, but it is. So what makes his, difficult history difficult? This is an article and I will put it in the chat um, if you would like to check it out um, that I'm going to reference in the next few slides um, by Luke Tara and Magdalena. It was published in Five Delta Kappa in um, 2018. Um, but what I want you to think about as I go through the next few slides, what are some historic examples that might apply to the statements that you're going to see on the screen? And these statements come from this article. There is a really great article. There are many, many more statements there, but I chose a few that I wanted you to think about historic um, examples that might apply to these particular statements. Difficult histories present a challenge to parents and students as well as teachers and administrators in part because the history or the purpose of school was to create citizens, but not just teach them about the past for past sake. So the purpose of our education system, basically the history of that was to create engaging citizens or informed citizens. We just got all mixed up with this trigonometry, wanting kids to have that too. Historic examples that might apply to this statement. Next statement. What makes difficult history difficult is not how it confirms or complicates a particular student's prior historical understanding, but the degree to which it challenges or undermines the dominant societal narrative. People really get bent out of shape when you want to say something contrary about Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator. Disagreement but we can still have discourse about it. The Emancipation Proclamation itself freed the enslaved peoples in the Confederate States of America. 
whole separate nation. Did not free the enslaved people that were still in the United States because we were still the United States. Many times we refer to it as the union, but we were still the United States. Controversy. Discomfort. Ooh, you're talking about the great Abraham Lincoln. But let's look at all of the sources. Let's look at all of the documents and then have our kids make a critical decision about how they feel about it, what their opinions are. Next, yet teaching the difficult past in its full complexity carries risk as well. While addressing difficult histories can be fundamental to the development of historical understanding, they complicate one of the traditional functions of history education in modern nation states to communicate a shared understanding of a national past to new generations. That's what we're going through right now. Bringing in all of this, what's being labeled as hidden histories is starting to complicate that traditional knowledge that we were all taught. Manifest Destiny is the greatest thing that ever happened to this country because we were able to move west and expand our nation and it was the God-given right to do so. Manifest Destiny. But there's another side to that story. Moving west, was also the genocide of indigenous peoples. Presenting students with that complication for many people is very difficult to hear and to have kids do something with. Teaching history is difficult. It is very difficult because up until this point, for us, it was, these are the facts. When was the War of 1812? 1812. Know the facts. There were jeopardies and Jay Leno was on the street asking people random history questions. And it was, our nation is failing because no one knows when the War of 1812 was. But now we're starting to bring in and expand that narrative. It's difficult, but ultimately, we want our students to engage with difficult histories without reinforcing ethnic, religious, and cultural divisions on the one hand, or undermining social cohesion on the other. Not trying to be divisive at all, but trying to bring in that other perspective that's not been explored in the past. Our hope is that such robust engagement might enable our young people to grow up with the ability to approach the past on their own terms and willingness to revise their historical understandings as new information emerges. Someone once said to me, history is fixed. The, the war ended at this day and you can't change that. Very true but there's a lot of other things that are going on in society, in the world that may have impacted the end date of that world, of that war. So where do we begin? This is what I am proposing to you. First of all, the marginalization of social studies in order for us to do this, students have to have time in actual social studies. I know that I am preaching to the choir, but I have to do it. Research um, consistently demonstrates that social studies receives le the least amount of instructional time. And this marginalization is having an impact on not only our students' knowledge, but also their skills. When we marginalize um, history and social science, we are also having difficulty with reading. And if you think about those reading passages, if you think about the reading SOL test, those are social studies and science passages that are many times being used if it's nonfiction text. 
this um, graphic was put out by CCSSO um, and in 2018. But what it says is reading the content, um, content knowledge makes weak readers better readers. So reading social studies and science content definitely helps those weak readers. Reading assessments require background knowledge from social studies disciplines like civics, economics, geography, and history. That's where you get your text from when you're going into your reading classes. Poor readers with strong background knowledge display better reading comprehension than strong readers with low background knowledge. In their study, they studied um, second graders who had 60 lessons of literacy rich social studies instruction and they scored 23% higher on their reading assessments. Reading, rigor and relevance. Let's go through this. So what can we do? I can talk all day long about dedicating the time, assessing social studies content and attending um, high quality professional development, but I'm going to focus on the use of high quality social studies resources and materials. There are three different resources that I want to show you today. And those you can use for English, you can use it for your social studies classes. Information sources are primary and secondary sources and artifacts. And what we are proposing is that you use a variety of texts, a variety, not just from the textbook, please. A variety of texts, texts that you can excerpt, texts that you can modify, texts that you can pull out vocabulary and it's still teaching content. So let's talk about paired passages. Um, getting students, students ready for paired passages, the first thing is to set the purpose. After you do that, you can read that first passage. It doesn't have to be long, but reading that first passage, whether it's with a large group or breaking it apart and giving it to small groups and we come back together and talk about that passage, then giving them a second passage and doing the same thing. After that, you'll have an opportunity to do compare and contrast. Looking at the passages, what they had in common, whether it was vocabulary they had in common, whether it was content they had in common, context that they had in common, characters, people, places, events that they had in common. And then lastly, asking the students, what did you enjoy about what you read? to get feedback from them. I did not like this at all. It just went on forever. Okay, well, we need to try something different. Paired passages also gives an opportunity to reinforce vocabulary, looking at that vocabulary in the context of the text itself. So I've chosen a standard. This standard is really focusing on the growth of cities and immigration. And that's me setting the purpose. What's the standard? We're gonna talk about immigration. And my big question in setting that purpose is how has America changed over time? One of my favorites, and I know I talk about it every time I meet with you all. So hopefully I'm not too redundant and you haven't seen it in um, an English prof um, professional development, but maybe you have, Common Lit. This is an excerpt called Shut the Door, written in 1924, dealing with immigration. Pairing that, with from um, Lithuania, Lithu, uh, Lithuania to Chicago stockyards. Still, the content is about immigration. So in our class, and I heard the past um, speakers were talking about stations. Something like this is excellent to put at 
three or four different stations and breaking the text up into smaller pieces and giving one or two questions for that particular piece. And then the students move from station to station experiencing these two articles. And at one station, it might be just a focus on vocabulary. But always going back to that bigger question. From these two articles, from what we are reading, from what I have broken down, how has America changed over time? Just from what you know and from what you have read. Again, we go through the fourth thing with that comparing and contrasting. Now that we've read different pieces, let's compare and contrast. What do they have in common? Students should from these two pieces come up with the fact that it's talking about immigration. They can come up with the date when it's happening, the commonalities between what was going on when they're talking about shut the door, what does that ring in your, in your mind first and foremost? And then an immigrant who left Lithuania and ended up in Chicago and his story. Reinforcing vocabulary. There are discipline vocabulary words that students need to have because of social studies and how to figure out the meaning of those words in the context of the passages that they are reading. This will give them an opportunity to not only compare and contrast, not only um, are they looking at context but they're also getting the content that they need for that standard. That standard is about immigration and how cities grew and the problems that many felt that immigration was causing. That's the social study standard. You can get the content from both of these pieces of writing, nonfiction text. Again, Common Lit is still free. All you have to do is register for it. It now goes down to third grade. It also gives you an opportunity to put it in different languages. It also gives you an opportunity to modify it for, um, for various learners. It is something that um, written into the program will help you to scaffold. It also um, gives you an opportunity to print it out and Common Lit is www.commonlit.org. Let's look at these images for a moment. When you see all of them, what is the big question that you might have? Drop a question, a big picture question that you might want to pose to students when they see these images. Why do people protest? Excellent. Talking about movements and protests starts in history and social science as early as Virginia studies. So wherever your school division decides to place Virginia studies, whether it's fourth grade or fifth grade, but it starts that early because that's when we start to get into the actual content. How do protests help mitigate change? So let's think about it this way. Again, choose a relevant standard. In fourth grade, it might be about uh, massive resistance. In um, US 2 it might be um, the early marches for um, the women's, right, women's suffrage. It might be um, movements like the civil rights movement. It might be um, in Virginia and U.S. history, any of those in high school. 
But what we want to do is figure out what we want students to know, understand, and be able to do. The know is the content. The understand is the big picture. And the do, how do we use the social science skills? So if you provide students with these three things, it will help with the know, understand, and be able to do. Questions, sources, and tasks. Questions, sources, and tasks. Questions help us help students with the big, the big picture, understanding the big picture. That's why I asked you all those, what are the big picture questions that you see when you see those images, that come to mind when you see those images? You all put some really great questions there. So the next thing that we would need to do is to find sources. And then what do we want them to do with those sources? So <clears throat> looking at the big questions, the questions that came to my mind, why do people protest? How does change happen in the United States? Do laws shape society or does society shape the law? Sources. For the images that we have, some of the sources I thought of were the Declaration of Independence paired with the Declaration of Sentiments. Taking small excerpts out of both of those and comparing that language. What do they have in common? What are they saying differently? Articles from the Washington Post, USA Today, local newspapers about protest marches. There was a, a teacher of mine that decided to look at one day in history um, when the United States declared war on Japan for World War II. How did local papers cover that announcement? So you can take any of these marches and look at how your local paper covered these marches. What type of language did they use? What facts were they using? Excerpts from speeches from elected officials. Anytime we have any type of protest or marches, there's some person that has been elected to office that has a comment about it. So looking at these different or varied sources, this is not something that you're going to get from a textbook. This is what provides relevance. Oh, I like that. What are the guiding principles of a nation that allows grievances against societal wrongs to be so to be voiced? I like that. I might have to steal that one, Daryl. Next, what should you have the students do? Now that you have your question, now that you've selected excerpts from your sources, what do you want them to do? First thing they probably need to do is define what a movement is, define what a protest is, so that when they approach these sources or when they're trying to respond to those questions, they have something to start with. Next, comparing and contrasting the language from the documents. And then I believe someone had um, a question earlier about the outcomes. Compare and contrast the outcomes of all of these different protests or marches that I have images for up on the screen. Students are using critical thinking skills. They are drawing conclusions based on what they see, based on what they read, based on what they have been able to synthesize and put together. Another um, source that I'm going to give you is the Stanford History Education Group, or as we like to call it, SHEG. What I like about SHEG is that many times when we try to excerpt some of these primary and secondary documents, you have to go through so much text or so much language. SHEG has done that for you. Everything that they have is very, very easy reading. And they do provide, um, a lot of the graphic organizers, but they don't spend a lot of time with um, marring kids down in a lot of heavy text. 
but they also provide graphic organizers for them to um, organize their thinking. This particular one is on Japanese segregation in um, San Francisco and really dealing with immigration once again. Um, they have a lot of images where students will have to look at an image, decide what do you see, what do you know, what can you conclude. Um, they also, in on their website, Reading Like a Historian, they do have a few um, assessments that will help with um, putting together a local alternative assessment, and it gives them an opportunity to um, develop a constructed response. So what is really great about um, SHEG is that it gives us an opportunity to move past when was the War of 1812. It gives us an opportunity to use basic reasoning strategies. Another one, and this one is very, very, very involved. If you decide to delve into C3 or um, inquiry design model, um, I would highly recommend that you not try to take it on all at once. IDM is very, very involved, but they have some wonderful big picture questions. Um, they have some really great sources. And so using that big question to help students um, write and then taking a source, maybe one or two of the sources and looking at the um, formative tasks that they want them to complete with that source. Sometimes it is creating a timeline. Sometimes it is creating a brochure. Sometimes it's just making a list. It gives you a really good opportunity for um, vocabulary instruction also. Um, C3 does a really good job of also scaffolding for um, varied students. What they are moving into is doing more with that scaffolding for English language learners. This is an example of um, the supporting questions and the type of tasks that you would see with, a, um, with an inquiry design. As you can see with that first one, there's a question and then students are making a list based on the source. So the sources are various Mexican migration stories and students are just making a list of various reasons why people have wanted to migrate from Mexico to, to the United States and why they have sometimes wanted to leave. They're just making a list, but it's going to the bigger question about putting up a border wall. The second um, supporting question, how has Mexican uh, migration to the United States changed over the last 50 years. The source that they have is um, a, a data chart and they can look at different numbers, different um, graphs, different charts and be able to draw conclusions from the charts. So many times it's not just text, but it's various information sources. This is all part of the same um, inquiry. So they have an opportunity to not only practice reading skills, but writing skills um, and their social science skills the whole entire time. They're building their history and social science background knowledge. Lastly, tried and true, always there for us is the Library of Congress especially during the um, pandemic, the Library of Congress really um, beefed up what they had to offer as far as their um, sources and their graphic organizers. Um, my favorite one is the primary source tool where um, students observe the source, whether it is reading, whether it is looking at an image, 
what have you. And then there are questions that students pose about what they're reading, what they're looking at. And then there are also questions that teachers can pose. And then after that, they reflect on what they saw and the questions that they had. Um, the Library of Congress, I don't, I can't even count the number of um, sources that they have, um, but with all of them, if you go to um, Teaching with Primary Sources within the Library of Congress um, website, you will be able to get to their graphic organizers. And they have also kind of like made a playlist of different sources. You search by topic and they'll give you sources that are relevant to that particular topic. But if you don't do anything, I would download the primary source analysis tool on their website or from their website. And again, there are plenty of opportunities for scaffolding within what they have on um, as far as sources. This is what the um, analysis tool looks like when you are analyzing maps. They have one for maps, they have one for photographs, they have one for um, film or videos. So with all of that, there are a few places that I want to make sure that I point out to you that have done a lot of work with us um, over the past year, really gotten more involved since March of 2020. Um, they have made more of their collections digital so that they are available online. Um, I know with everyone starting to open back up, that's great, but we still need to have access um, the way that we have in the past because like it or not, COVID-19 changed the way that we almost do everything in life. Um, the Library of Virginia is in Richmond and they have a lot of Virginia specific documents. Um, they have a awesome collection when it comes to, for example, um, at one time, they don't have it um, physically there anymore, but at one time, Virginia's secession um, papers were in the Library of Virginia on um, display, but they do have in their rare files room a lot of the documents that established government in Virginia, um, documents that we use today as far as primary um, sources are concerned. Again, Library of Congress teaching with primary sources. The Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, they are wonderful when you want to have something a little bit different. We, we talk a lot about text, we talk a lot about maps, but to see something that comes from the cultural history that is going to reflect also what's going on at the time. Um, over at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, they are also responsible for Virginia History Day. And the, the History Day project is much like a performance assessment. But what with what Virginia History Day does, it gives you different products that students can um, create rather than just a constructed response. I do want to bring um, special attention to eMedia VA. They have a lot of videos. Um, all of us have a login into um, eMedia VA. They also have um, created specific playlists that are either videos or lessons or some type of um, artifact in a compilation, but you can search for a topic and there are various playlists that they have put together for us. Um, professional development, many of you might have attended our Building a Community of Learners last summer and fall. We will be continuing um, that starting up in August. 
And then lastly, in October of 2020, the Virginia Board of Education um, approved um, the recommended edits to curriculum frameworks for Virginia, excuse me, K-2, Virginia Studies, US-1, US-2, and Virginia and US History. On our website, you'll see those curriculum frameworks and they'll be listed as updated. To support the changes in the curriculum frameworks, we do have what's called the Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative. That collaborative went put together with museums and history and social science specialists worked to build resources that would support teachers in teaching this new content. It is available on Go Open VA. So all you have to do is search for the Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative Hub, and you will see um, learning experiences. We don't call them um, lesson plans, learning experiences, and then a um, curated list of resources for every one of the edits that were made. Lastly, quotes from um, various people when it comes to history, but I do want to um, focus your attention on Dr. Maya Angelou's um, quote there. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. They're all basically saying the same thing. So this one, I'm not gonna read it to you, but I'd like for you to take a guess at, how, at who you think made this quote. There's a little clue at the bottom. Good job, Heather. <laughs> my bad. I was, I typed John Adams and then I went, oh my God, no, I meant Lewis. I meant Lewis. <laughs> so yes. That's okay. summer break in a nutshell. Yes. <laughs> you must also study and learn the lesson of history because humanity has been involved in this soul wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change. And that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. I end most of my presentations with this. We do need your help, your support, and anything that we can do to help support you, please just reach out to us. But we must approach history and social science instruction differently. We must. If nothing has taught us anything over the past um, few years, we must teach history and social science differently. We can no longer rely on the memorization of facts because one is not enough and two, we have to give a clearer picture of what those facts are. So we had a lot of references to specific um, products. We don't endorse any, but they're the ones that are free and that do what we are aligned with what we are trying to do as far as instruction, assessment, and our standards, we do share with um, teachers. So at this time, um, I will put our contact information on the screen, um, give you a minute if you wanna take that down and um, also answer any questions that you may have. And I can't believe it, Teresa and Kim, I finished five minutes early. I never do that. Any questions, you can unmute and ask if you like. <laughs> oh, yes. Hi, um, this is Mary Beth Concien. Um, 
let me see if I can get my question is with the new um, curriculum frameworks that integrate black history into the K-12 curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with some colleagues to create interdisciplinary lesson plans with English and social studies because there's so many English texts that yes. uh, both adolescent lit like the hate you give and all American boys and you know, so many present day texts today that fit very well with mm -hmm. Toni Morrison's Beloved. And, um, you know, so I'm the English person working with a social studies specialist to integrate the new standards with the English standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just wondering if any professional development money was going to be coming down from the state in order to educate um the teachers in the state of Virginia on how to integrate the new standards? Um, again, we um, have the resources that we put up there and I don't know about money per se, but my program will be doing- um, You do that? Yeah. We okay, will, oh, excellent, okay. We will start that in um, August. Right now we're trying to get our presenters together and also um, the various topics, but we wanted something to be available. That's why we put um, out the Dr. Carter G. Woodson Collaborative. And if you go one, go open, you can start there and then okay. we'll have actual professional development that will occur in August, October, and November. We try not to do anything in September because kids are trying to find where their lockers are and teachers are trying to learn their names. So we try to not do too, too much in um, September. Wonderful, thank you so much. Other questions? No? Okay, well, Kim, I will send you this. Um, presentation so that you can send it out wherever you need to. And um, please make sure that you are in contact with your school's department chair or your divisions, um, the person responsible for history and social science at your division level, because they get um, information directly from us. And we will also put um, as much as we can in Teacher Direct. So if you have not subscribed to Teacher Direct, please do so. And your division person will have information regarding our um, building a community of learners. We'll try really, really hard. I can't make any promises because we are also going through standards revision. Yay! Um, right now. So um, that'll be going on. So we'll try to get the list up on the um, up on the DOE websites. Um, we'll get a copy of the presentation with your resource links. Yes, um, I will send that to Kim and mm -hmm. she will send it out yeah. um, to, to you all. You will find that in the in the folder later on this afternoon or tomorrow in the Google folder, everybody. Okay. Mm-hmm.